Hello, you're listening to Hold On a Minute, a podcast by UNFPA Asia and the Pacific. This podcast series presents inspiring and powerful stories on the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women across the Asia Pacific region. I'm Pupei Chawarat Yong Jiranon, your host. On this episode of Hold On a Minute by UNFPA Asia Pacific, entitled Measuring Violence Against Women, we highlight how the collection of data is key to preventing gender based violence. Gender based violence is one of the most prevalent human rights violations around the world. Unfortunately, some of the highest rates of gender based violence are present in the Asia Pacific region. In such a large region filled with diverse culture and communities, it is important to determine what resources are needed, where they are needed, and how much of it is needed. Prevalence data enables UNFPA and its partners to pinpoint the number of people affected by gender based violence and the factors associated with it. Ultimately, precision targeting in interventions can be done, lives can be saved. So far, 32 out of the 36 countries in the Asia Pacific region have completed a survey allowing UNFPA to support technical assistance to statistical offices and ministries to build internal capacities. Today, we take a look at Mongolia and its success story in conducting a survey that has, in turn, enabled authorities to address gender based violence in the country more efficiently. I'm honored. To speak with Aaron Bol Shakhtar, the director of the Census and Data Analysis Department of the National Statistics Office of Mongolia. He has over 20 years of experience in official statistics work, in particular, methodology and data analysis in Mongolia. Oyun Basrash, a former UNFPA gender program specialist who has worked with the UN since 1997. Over 24 years, she has worked at the UNDP, WHO, and UNFPA. She specializes in areas such as HIV AIDS prevention, adolescent health service, population development, and gender equality women's empowerment, and gender based violence, or GBV, prevention and response. And Jessica Gardner, the UNFPA's technical lead on violence against women data and research. For the Asia Pacific region. She is dedicated to supporting countries to produce safe and robust m e a s u r e of gender based violence. She has nearly two decades of experience working with governments and civil society to produce and use gender statistics effectively. Hello, everyone. It is clear that information is crucial for change. So, In our episode today, I'm so excited to talk with Aaron Bold, Jessica, and Yun about their work on the field and how important it is to have information to ensure that there is、uh, a more improvement in gender based violence、uh, situations around the world. So, without further ado, I'd like to greet all of my guests today. I feel so excited because usually I talk to one or two people, but today I have three people with me. Hello, everyone. Now, the topic that we have at hand today is definitely a very serious one. And I think it's very important because, as what we've mentioned before, information is key for change. And it's proof that there needs to be、uh, certain actions taken and can also help with the way that we approach challenges. When we take a look at data, why data is important for gender based violence,、um, can I ask? Uh, perhaps maybe、uh, Jessica, in terms of why this is so important. Thanks, Pupay. Hi, everyone.、Um, data and statistics are an incredibly important piece of evidence to show us what is happening、uh, for people in terms of their experiences of gender based violence and, in this case, violence against women.、Uh, if we think about The most common form of violence against women, which is intimate partner violence. Much of that has been taboo, a taboo topic. People don't talk about it. It happens behind closed doors. It's a very stigmatized issue. And for that reason,、um, we don't really know what's going on in people's lives unless we ask them purposefully in a, in a survey. We can't tell from police records or 
health records or the number of hotline calls, what is happening to people because many will never talk about it to anyone else. So data and statistics really sheds light on this terrible issue so we can do something about it. One of the biggest steps that has been taken is the National Statistical Office uh, preparing uh, this survey that we've been mentioning on our podcast. Um, Aaron Bolt, why did the NSO undertake this survey? Okay, thank you for your questions. So because uh, it's uh, our reputation and trustworthy organization in the country, so we have a good, very good experience, especially for the conducting nationwide uh, large-scale sample surveys. That's the, maybe one reason to conduct this survey. So that's the, also we have uh, maybe some good structure. Also, we have uh, 21 provinces, uh, additionally 9 districts. We have uh, local branches. So we can have uh, some capacity for we have a good capacity for organizing this uh, kind of the survey. Ayund, would you like to add anything to your work that has been occurring? Thank you, sure, Kope. Yeah, it's a former UNFP staff and who was really closely involved in the conduct of this survey. I also really want to retreat what Ayun was saying. Why NSO was selected? Because NSO is a UNFP's long-term partner and also the UNFP invested also a lot in capacitating the NSO staff in dealing with the different social statistics, including gender and GBV. Yeah, so they have they are the one of our most reliable uh, partner. Uh, so that's why we were very sure only they can do conduct this very important and very sensitive survey. And if you allow me, I also want to talk about a little bit story, history. The UNFP system data agency, we really committed to strengthen the data, especially particularly GBV and violence against women that data in the country. So that's why we really took the systematic approaches to strengthen this data. And first, they started in 2007 with the introduction of the uh, violence against women data into the police statistics, administrative statistics. Later on in 2009, also we added the uh, violence against women data into the police crime statistics. And also that's why no one really uh, took this issue seriously. Because in the past, everyone thought that they're just the issue between men and women. It is the private one. They need to really uh, solve this in their uh, relationship. No one really see that issue is a uh, human right violation and it's a crime. Uh, that's why this uh, administrative data really gives us also some sense uh, and uh, some evidence. And later in 2012, UNFP, the, our first effort to conduct the nationwide GBV survey. Yeah, but we realized the situation and we continuously, we didn't give up, but we continuously advocate and sensitizing our different stakeholders, including MPs and CSO themselves, and the also public. In 2015, a Swiss Development Agency approached us uh, to submit, uh, invited us to submit the concept note on combating GBV in Mongolia. But it should include survey itself and also it should have other components, service and capacity building, public awareness, coordination, all other components. So that was the our, at the end, uh, we uh, reached what we were really aspiring to do. And for that, uh, our APRO colleagues, including NOVA data, global lead experts like the, uh, Henry Jensen and Jessica Gardner, and also the, our Sujata uh, from the APRO, and from NSO, our capable team really helped us to secure this funding. And all this was done under the great leadership of our country representative, Naomi Kitahara. So I thought this might be also helpful for other countries. 
because funding is very important. The survey itself very sensitive and it requires very high technical expertise. Also a lot of training, sensitization, all the stakeholders who is involved in this, not just the researchers. That's why it won't just happen easily overnight. It So a lot of efforts, continuous efforts and really needed. So what a journey. What a journey it has been for you to be able to to conduct the survey. But then when you talk about uh, conducting the survey itself, as mentioned by our other panelists or our other uh, guest speakers on our episode today, Jessica as well, um, when you talk about issues about uh, gender-based violence, it's so sensitive um, for an issue for a woman who's going through it they might not even be comfortable talking to their closest friend or their closest family members, let alone someone from the outside. So when you look at the survey itself, um, how has the experience been in terms of, you know, the challenges that you face uh, when you talk about such intimate uh, relations and also the sexual violence? Um, These are deeply personal and in very affecting questions. Um, How does this impact the practical elements of conducting the survey? Uh, Aaron Ball? Okay, thank you. So actually quantitative and qualitative surveys and studies, both of them conducted nowadays. So as for the quality studies, if we need the additional information uh, because of the sometimes quantitative Studies is they not covered all the all the aspects or all the issues. So we conducted uh, quality studies, and so in a group of in Fox Group uh, discussion, there is a many serious case of the physical or emotional abuses. This is by an intimate partner we reported. But in terms of sexual violence, there was a lot of talk about violence caused by someone other than the intimate partners. The many forms of physical violence by intimate partners have been reported for the women. For example, being chased by car, as a chase by horse, and wrapped with a veil and whip, or covering face with a wet novel. And also wrapped with black socket and beating pregnant pregnant woman who it is impacted the effect of the abortion and so on. And uh, more than forty types of violent types were recorded. So in our service, sometimes when the data collection process, sometimes it's difficult to contact with women. Because uh, sometimes, you know, victim of the violence ran away from home, sometimes was absent. Also, we didn't know where is she. But that's the also main, uh, main issue for in that collection processes. Also, there has been some cases, enumerators or interviews were scared, nervous because of the they listen whole the story of the victim of the violence. So the, uh, uh, in our service, uh, psychologists is working with our inmates because of the, sometimes they, when they listen to their respondents, they also feeling some depression and anxiety. So this is why we, we really would uh, organize the training or survey training for the uh, research or inmates. And um, also, sometimes in writers also share their experience, uh, and they give some motivation to the other other narrators. Oh, I can't, I can't imagine um, being an interviewer and you know being in such a sensitive 
um, situation, especially as uh, you, you mentioned that uh, most of the time the, the interviewers have been past victims themselves, which in a way we can understand that it kind of serves the theory that if you have those people, you know, interviewing, it will make things easier. But then at the same time, it's so sensitive. So can I ask you a little bit more uh, Yun, about how uh, you approach these sensitivities. Um, what has the training been like for the interviewers? Okay, yes. Because, yeah, during the, the collection of the Soviet the collection, there were many difficulties for the, especially because the inverted is the female. It's, uh, it's because of the Suwi, who are sensitives. So I mentioned, uh, so for cause of the inmates listening and uh, talking with the abused woman, and uh, they will explore. They will re- try to recognize the what's the condition and the circumstances which we, which woman experienced it. So sometimes maybe inmates giving them advice, also simultaneously feeling depressed and some confusion and shocking. Maybe sometimes crying together. Although they're sharing the pain experienced by abusive women, so they feel in their feelings and uh, in brief is very depressed and had, had some difficulties coping with that something uh, difficult situation. And also sometimes in brief cons- concerns uh, continuously thinking, uh, thinking about uh, their history and their story. So, in fact, uh, I would like to mention one fact or example. Uh, one woman who participated in this study in the one province in Mongolia that was frequently abused by her partner. So, she approached to the enumerators after the survey. And the research team also supported her and maybe contacted the address at this issue to the some relevant state organization. And uh, it's uh, something about uh, research uh, in Rikers in our study. It was, uh, they shared our, their experience. She mentioned about that it was really emotional to be a confident person. And uh, sometimes it's uh, sitting together and maybe sometimes crying. But however, most of the women who selected in this survey Often talking about the, their secrets, they share their secrets of with the enumerators. So, yeah, that's the for the sensitive issues. Uh, uh, our training, uh, with and we hope we our training very successfully completed because of the because of 20, uh, 20 or twenty one days is a more longer period. We train it all the interviews and uh, explain. Also, we conducted pre test and pilot testing, and the enumerators expect to uh, which environment or what kind of the condition they will face. So, also, psycholog- psychologists also uh, explain it it's, uh, this kind of the sensitivity issues, how to communicate with the respondents. So our plan and uh, training and preparation work is well done. Wow. Uh, a lot, a lot to do. Sorry, Oyun, yes? Yes, thank you, Arun Bolt. I also want to just add the two more points. Yeah, so one of the challenges uh, which happened for the, especially during the field work, uh, whenever uh, interview, narrators wanted to have an interview with the a woman and sometimes there is a no space no private space which can uh, provide the privacy for two of them and still the husband is around and also very much interested to listen to know what's about that so all these specific sensitivities were addressed during the training and even we called, even we changed the uh, name of the survey, not just the uh, GBV Violence Against Women survey. We called, named the survey Women's Health 
issue, something like that, differently. They really lack in the uh, safe space. Even sometimes our enumerators and the researchers taking the woman into their car and had a interview there, or going to the very remote field where they can pasture their animals, or something like that. So these were the one very sensitive and also very important issue of the safety. And our INUSO team, with the uh, guidance of the APRO NOVA team, really dealt very well. So we didn't have any issue during the data collection field work. Uh, one more thing, maybe I was planned to talk it later, no, but also it's still challenging. Uh, we had the advisory committee for the survey, which consisted governmental, non-governmental, uh, and also different academician and practitioners involved included. But everyone, every member of the advisory team wasn't at the same levels of the knowledge about the issue. So these are the also were challenging, and I thought it might be also helpful for the countries uh, how can tackle this type of challenges during the survey. Thank you. Wow, I can't imagine. You know, uh, especially when you want to interview someone who is in that situation in the same house with potential person who's. Um, giving that violence or, or conflicting uh inflicting that violence on that person um very 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 sensitive and also you have to have great knowledge of the context that you're in at that time okay well you know i think we really can't really know what really goes through the minds or the situation of an interview unless we hear a story about it. So we're going to take a short break and listen to a short story to get a glimpse as to what the experience it is like for an interviewer uh, for this survey. My name is Oyuna and I am a survey interviewer. I worked with the National Statistical Office of Mongolia during the National Survey on Gender-Based Violence. That is not like other surveys. Yes, I asked about age, address, and marital status, the obvious things. But I'm here to ask more than that. I ask about lives, about relationships. I ask about things people do not always want to share. I remember one interview I did. The house was just out of Dalansadgad. For some time, we had been trying to reach this woman to do the interview. Excuses regarding her absence were numerous. She's gone to pick pine nuts and will not be back soon. She is sick or something else. After our persistent attempts to find her, she was located with the help of the local administration officer and we went to meet her. Her partner opened the door. She was in bed. She was wearing sunglasses. She was visibly in pain. I was afraid and in shock, but trying hard not to show that to her. I needed to understand her experience. I approached the woman and asked if I could talk with her for about 20 minutes. I asked her how she was feeling, or if it is better to do this tomorrow, but she insisted on talking. Her partner was sitting across the room and watching us. I took out a dummy questionnaire, a set of general demographic survey questions that would be safe to ask with the partner there. He would not leave us alone to conduct the interview in private. Luckily, his phone rang and he left to meet his friends. Once he'd left and we were alone, I started the proper interview and she told me everything. I was deeply shocked. My hands wouldn't stop shaking, but I did all I could to pull myself together. As I ended the interview and prepared to leave, the woman said, Where were you 10 years ago? That is why I ask these questions. That is why we do this work. Without these answers, this data, these stories wouldn't end. Knowing where, how, and to whom this violence is happening is essential for ending it. Not with tests and trials, but with evidence-based interventions to stop this violence before it starts. 
Hold on a minute. A podcast series by UNFBA Asia Pacific. Okay. So that was a short story brought to us, uh, giving us the experience of an interviewer. And we think about the challenges. Certainly, we've mentioned it before. There are physical challenges in conducting such a survey in Mongolia. Um, in addition to what we talked about in terms of managing the physical aspects and the uh, emotional aspects of interviews, Aaron Ball, do you have anything else that you might want to share with us in terms of um, managing these challenges? Uh, we mentioned before of that uh, training is uh, we are uh, trained uh, in rates very well. So we think maybe this is some relatively uh, low problems uh, faced during the data collection. However, Mongolia is the um, specific country, let alone it between China and Russia. And our territory is vast and few and many mountains, rivers and hills, especially for the countryside data collection. It's because of the some uh, poor development of the roads in some parts and causes significant some difficulties because uh, it's uh, mainly uh, rich to the how to reach the household. It's uh, uh, facing some challenges. But however, some similar problems in urban and rural areas, for example, uh, sometimes it's just, uh, some households keeping the dogs are sitting in the mud and sand and water in the countryside. And especially then the maybe northern province, there were, were quite few cases where the team's car got stuck in the mud. And uh, Emirates also helped and support pushed their cars, their ourselves. It's also problems. However, they always solving this kind of the issue. Also, maybe crossing the river and sometimes uncommon in our country, but uh, uh, there were, have been some cases where uh, inmates have driven their cars into the cars. In addition, there were cases crossing the river by full foot, feet, riding a horse or riding a motorcycle or reaching the household in, in the rural area. But also, I would like to mention sometimes the, in rural areas, especially in the rural area, there is the no electricity and no power and sometimes networks. So enumerators and supervisors need to keep their requirement, need to more safe. Also trying to charge if they reach the some center, some technical problems, but uh, yeah, based on the good collaboration with the local government, local administrative units, and so on. I never would think about dogs <laughs> or, or crossing the river or riding a horse, but yeah. everything, all of these things do count. And as what you mentioned, it's so important to have that communication and that relationship with local uh, administrators. And so, you know, when you talk about collaboration. It is very important in all aspects. And when we take a look at partners that are involved with this survey, um, Jessica, how have the engagement been so far with the partners? So a survey like this involves a lot of moving parts. There are many people that need to be engaged in the process and, of course, to have ownership over it. It's essential to bring those partners along right from the beginning so that there's understanding about why this survey is being conducted, what it is measuring, how it is measuring it, because um, everyone has an idea or an opinion about gender-based violence, no matter what their experience is. And this is about getting some evidence on the table that shows what we can find out from a statistical perspective about people's experiences. So that may differ quite a lot from what people are expecting to find out. So having those partners around the table early to share that commitment to go out into the field and collect this information and to do that safely with the principle of doing no harm, essentially guiding every 
decision and every activity along the way, it's really essential to have those people around the table. And uh, I know the way it was done in Mongolia was really a model case where you have a very high level steering committee of decision makers and donors and the people that are behind this commitment. And then you have a technical group of people with academics, specialists across all different sectors, civil society, uh, government, academia, who are coming around the table and talking about those technical details, how the questions are asked, how the interviewers are trained, all those considerations. It's really essential. That group has to be relatively closed while the planning is going on because this kind of survey, as you can tell, it's not business as usual. It's not the kind of survey that we kind of promote and say on the radio, we're coming out to your community to ask people about violence against women. Obviously, you can't do that with a survey like this. It needs to be conducted with only the people that need to know, having any knowledge that the survey is actually going on. And even the local administrators who need to help you get into those communities, they don't know the survey is about violence. They know it's about women's health and life experiences and and issues related to women, but they don't need to know the content of the survey because that has to be kept um, confidential until the interview teams have been into those communities and been able to exit safely without putting the women at risk, without putting themselves at risk and really doing no harm. So the partners are key. Having them involved is key and keeping that group to the people that need to be involved. But then once you have the data and you, you're through that really challenging situation of going out into the communities, then you can broaden that partnership group and really involve people that can discuss what does this data mean? Because it needs to be contextualized, right? It needs to make sense in the context of that country. So it's not just about the numbers, it's discussing, well, what do we find out from this? What does it mean in the context of Mongolia? Or what does it mean in the context of Bhutan or, or in the Marshall Islands or all these countries across our region that have done this great work? And yeah, participation is, is really an essential part of that. So people understand the numbers and they can, they can back them and, and believe them when they come out. And most importantly, that they use them and apply them in their policy and, and decisions and the, and the work that they're doing to eliminate gender-based violence. Well, talking about learning from your experience in Mongolia and, and applying that, as I said, you know, it, it's so much more than what maybe the typical person would think in terms of the survey being so sensitive and you seeing so many challenges in terms of emotions and physical aspects of it. Um, Ayun and Arnbald, when we take a look at what you've done so far, what kind of lessons can be learned from, from your experience in Mongolia that perhaps maybe can be applied to other countries as a model? So as Jessica mentioned, the collaboration and partnership is very important. I think the one of the key also aspect of our success was a close collaboration with the government at the national level as well as the uh, local level and also our strong CSO involvement and um, uh, the uh, multi-sectoral uh, participation. The representatives from different sectors were really actively participated. It's a result of our sensitivity and advocacy efforts. They become aware of this is how important the data, particularly how important the prevalence survey in our uh, identifying our future interventions, actions, and the, even be involved with the individuals also, uh, research team. So this, uh, and at the local level, our the NSO office, local offices were very high reputation and also that they were really keen into the managing all logistics related to the uh, work. Uh, as mentioned, Arunbald, the dog issue. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's, uh, it's the Mongolia is a nomadic country, our countryside. So that was a, also, they gain the uh, importance of partnership. Partners, partnering means not just at the policy level, 
it's every logistical, every steps of the survey needs to be planned very well and also needs to be uh, considered all the possible challenges and the mitigation strategies. For that, to solve this uh, challenge, the partnership was played really key role. And also I want to say that we had a very good uh, survey coordinator who has a fluent English and who is uh, really, uh, they have a high level of knowledge in the area of gender and human rights issues. So she also really played a key role bringing all these uh, partners together and also the connecting each of these partners into one platform. Yeah, so that part I wanted really to say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I would like also mention the collaboration is the most essential part of the kind of the survey because uh, we need to build some common understanding why we conducting this kind of the survey. What is the outcome? What is the impact for the... So, which means uh, all possible stakeholders should be the engaged this for survey. So collaboration is first. So collaboration will be built uh, some budget issue, planning, and uh, having involved with other stakeholders and so on. And secondly is, uh, I would like to say the planning. If good planning, then we can follow the step by step, then we yeah, reach the, our final destination mentally. And also training. Training is the most important part, I think, because uh, activity of the enumerators is in effect affect to the data quality. If we would like to uh, obtain the very good quality data, then enumerator should understand everything, every questionnaire, every concept, especially the for gender and gender-based violence. What is the gender issue? What is the gender-based uh, uh, wasted violence? Then they will, um, totally, communication is maybe uh, third special, uh, essential aspect, for the, especially for the narrators. If they have a very good communication and also they control their emotion and also they uh, should maybe sometimes control the interviews, uh, respondents. So that's the maybe I would like to share with the other countries. Also, during the data collection, safety of the enumerators is the main issue, or the, especially for the related to the log logistical things. And finally, I would like to, if you plan and the when will conduct the when when will conduct a data collection in some period. Because in our case, we our data collection is the our left with the election election period. So sometimes this is the maybe some problem. Uh, very, very important points that you've pointed out in terms of the importance of collaboration, partnership, especially at the local uh, scale and as well as the training, obviously, as what you've mentioned in terms of understanding the context of what's been going on, as well as being able to, I guess, uh, adapt to the situation as it comes and also the timing. That's quite right, uh, as what you mentioned there. Now, of course, the work has been done. You've had results. And uh, it's very exciting, I'm sure, because uh, it's been a lot of effort that has taken in terms of trying to get this quality result. When you look at it, are do you see any factors uh, that maybe surprise you that you might didn't you know expect to get after you conducted this survey? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So first, I would like to mention the response rate in our survey. Because the survey is very sensitive topics, we expect that many respondents could, uh, could be the refuse for the interviews. But if we reach, if we, uh, we had a very good communication and also we, are, we have a support from the local administrators. So in our survey, 
but uh, uh, response rate is uh, quite high, so which is unexpected results. And uh, secondly, in military cells, uh, all the military is female because of the sensitive topics and gender-based violence. So in military is really, really good recognize the their situation, their importance of the this data, the importance of the disorder, because uh, they are working for girls, women in our country, and uh, protecting hum uh, human rights, especially for the women rights and the maybe inequality in our countries. And if we had uh, very accurate numbers and data, then we can develop a very good policy and very good planning and a very good law for for the women. So which means they really understand and they very proud of their own work, collecting this data and uh, in the right way. So they was proud who she was. And thirdly, some of that is maybe sometimes uh, very interesting factors. Especially the for the for young women, twenty to thirty four years old, who had been the uh, faced violence was uh, has some is uh, quite high compared with the other age groups. That's the very interesting. So which means maybe Mongolian Mongolian government need to really really consider on the some younger women because uh, they faced more violence compared with the other age stakeholders. Which means young women may be uh, likely to face or experience with uh, uh, some physical violence in their lifetime. So in some time, in some cases, also with some, uh, uh, we also un uh, some unexpected is uh, maybe unexpected or maybe it's uh, uh, something. Sixty five percent of who suffered some cyber sexual violence. It's uh, from others with their own homes, which means uh, it's uh, this type of the crime is usually uh, maybe in the cycle of people who know know each other, which means uh, yeah, it's very close. Uh, maybe yeah, it's very close to the this uh, victim of the violence. Uh, that's the, some maybe interesting facts in from our results. Interesting facts that you've just revealed in terms of, uh, you know, the younger age group uh, being impacted by violence and also the factor of uh, alcohol in the situation. So when we take a look at the impact of the survey itself among policymakers and practitioners uh, in Mongolia, how can this uh, be implemented or have a change in the way things are regulated or possibly policies could be changed to better the situation. Thank you, Kupe. Yeah, I really happy to respond to this <laughs> question. Yeah, because the survey was conducted in 2017 and uh, released its result in 2018. So since then, now it's around five years time. So, but a lot of changes has happened in the area of combating gender-based violence, violence against women in Mongolia. Many progresses have been um, uh, there. So, which means that our policymakers understanding about the uh, GBV and violence against women and its implications in the uh, individual, uh, family, and social society, how it's impacting all these levels of people's lives. Yeah, so the first I just want to say the only example. By the time 2016, which is a little bit before the, when we decided to conduct the survey, the government allocation to the, to combating violence against women was only 20 million Mongolian to Greek. But as a result of the data, how it's translated the, into the action, as a result, the government allocation of the fund in this area reached to the 10.6 billion Mongolian to Greek. And also the, it, the survey data, really the, uh, 
identified the location and need of the uh, one-stop service centers and shelters for the victims of the violence. And it identified and also used in uh, preparation and approval of the standard operating to implement the newly revised law to combat domestic violence. 33, 17 one-stop service centers and 17 shelters operating throughout the country, which means every province and district has a facility to receive clients and provide different services from the one stop. So these are the how the attitude of the decision makers, how the policies are changed. And so, yeah, this is the result, one big result. It's amazing, isn't it? That there's so much can be done by one survey. If you just invest in such a quality survey that you've seen so many changes all abroad uh, across the board for Mongolia, I feel very hopeful for what's been, you know, happening in Mongolia. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners are, you know, feeling that hope. So what's next then for the NSO uh, after completing this successful survey? Uh, how are you going to work to ensure that uh, this valuable uh, data is used further uh, in the future? Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually, after the survey collection and uh... Uh, we uh, conduct a several national workshops and try to aware to the public awareness. So our uh, this survey data set is uh, available for everyone. So everyone can use, especially for the policymaker, research, student practitioners, anyone. So it's which means everyone can use this data and they can find some in some insights or reflection from the data they can use it so now we are working uh, uh, but uh, you know it's uh, policy makers or some government level staff need to really understand this kind of the data and they will they should use or apply in their polit- uh, policy documents and their program, which we which they developed. So recently, uh, Jessica and Jessica team, we are collaborating with the secondary data analysis of the gender-based violence 2017. So which means, uh, uh, already some time has passed. So maybe now, uh, maybe next year, we will consider second wave of the, this kind of second wave or second round of the survey because uh, this already six year passed, which means we need to consider the next uh, survey. So uh, we will hopefully, we will collaborate on that. We discussed about this issue with uh, UNFP Mongolia and uh, we will plan some activities next year and we need to find some budget or expenditure for related survey issue and uh, if we prepare next year successfully then we will maybe uh, conduct the survey maybe 2025 and uh, but uh, right now is not sure but uh, now it's uh, next year could be the preparation work will be done and uh, yeah, it needs to uh, take advocacy from the other stakeholders, government, and other ministry, relevant ministries, donor organization, and so on. And um, hopefully, we will uh, organize this kind of survey. And of end of the, this year, we released uh, some secondary data analysis results, and uh, we will organize the two two kind of two workshops. For the practitioners, also for the some government or some uh, more high level workshop, and uh, also we will provide some publish some policy brief for the attention to the policy makers. Just uh, completing the survey is not good enough. All the policy maker decision makers should use and apply, and uh, after that we measure the 
how they change it, how women's women violence is uh, changed. Also, hopefully, with uh, positive changes, will be lead. Uh, maybe okay. Jessica will add uh, some collaboration with uh, UNFP APRO and UNFP Mongolia and the uh, Emiso. Okay. You. Well, you know, I I just wanted to uh, because we're 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 kind of like going beyond our time limit, but I, uh, we will have time to edit. Uh, but I I just want to give an opportunity to each of you to say a key takeaway that you know our listeners can uh, gain from our conversation on our episode. Uh, what they should know in terms of the importance of information and how it can really impact you know, the community and create change. Jessica? Thank you. Um, I wanted to say that this kind of work, it really shows a commitment by governments, by all the people involved to confronting this issue of gender-based violence, which we know, thanks to the statistics, is widespread. It has huge impacts on the women that experience it, their children, their families. It has huge impacts on society in terms of the costs and the lost productivity, um, the services. So it's statistics that that does provide a foundation for us to recognise how big the problem is, what are its drivers, and what we can do to eliminate it. And I want to commend the governments that have put this on the agenda, and, and that is most countries in the Asia-Pacific region where UNFPA works, most countries, 29, can produce national level statistics on this issue. And a good proportion of them, 12 countries, have done this more than once. So it's great to hear that the plans in Mongolia are to to do a second wave because that does um, help to see how this how our work to end these forms of violence is is having an impact. And Countries have signed up to this already, actually, because in committing to achieve the sustainable development goals, there's a commitment to eliminate violence against women. And and part of that commitment is producing these statistics on prevalence. And the only way that we can produce those statistics is by conducting random national level surveys as the one that we've been talking about today. And if you think about that well-known quote, what is measured is treasured. And here what we treasure is is ending violence against women if we're willing to measure the extent of the problem um, and use that data to make a change. I think that shows that the commitment to to address this this human rights violation. Aaron Ball? Okay, thank you. So for the final words, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe only mentioned about uh, we have uh, some records about uh, some cases in the police office. That's uh, not good enough. But however, uh, there is uh, some gap between the uh, you know the data demand and supply. So which means uh, I think uh, this survey is uh, maybe fill this gap. Or it's this story will provide more information about the uh, women based violence, well, yeah, gender based violence, who women experience it. Then, country and government and the policymakers already made some commitment to the global level and the national level. They should understand current circumstances in our country related with the women violence. So which means they should have uh, some kind of the data sources and they also should use this data more uh, more efficiently, which means they should apply or they should use this data. So which means uh, they also maybe educate or some kind of data literacy issues. So yeah, and after that, if they have uh, some data, they can see the whole picture of the country level then where is the problem specifically maybe which province or which kind of the problems uh, who is the main reason of the violence and who made violence who is the victims and which uh maybe by age group maybe by education level maybe 
unemployment is maybe a core consumption. So, and they have the, this kind of the comprehensive information. They can develop a very good uh, maybe policy and program, but it's not good enough. Uh, after that, uh, they also need to implement. They always control the this uh, developed activity, planned activity, and uh, they should measure of the result. That's the maybe ongoing process and uh, uh, always trying to eliminate uh, all the violence. And if they have the very good numbers, then they know and they know uh, develop the very good policy documentation and uh, also measure the, what they have done for the women. And uh, finally, uh, we can reach our final destination, our uh, final aim. So thank you, Arun. So it's very important. And together with the NSO UNFP also last three, four years, we continuously advocated to include the National GBV survey into the statistics law. Uh, if it would be successful, if it's included there, a funding issue would be at least a half the solved. And uh, repeatedly, we can do it. Thank you so much for opening our eyes into how important it is for us to have quality information and the impact it has on uh, various changes that uh, are so close to the our lives throughout the whole world, you know, our different communities. And also thank you to um, uh, you know, our colleagues here at uh, Mongolia, uh, Arunbald and Oyun for telling us your success story with the survey that has been conducted and showing that it really does have an impact on the country and the world. Thank you so much. This has been the latest episode of Hold On A Minute by UNFPA Asia Pacific, measuring violence against women, highlighting how crucial data collection is in preventing gender-based violence. The successful case of Mongolia has proven it works and reveals the need to continue the work to gather more data to change lives for the better. For more insightful episodes of Hold On A Minute by UNFPA Asia Pacific, follow our podcast pages on Spotify, Facebook, YouTube, and Apple Podcast. Just search for UNFPA Hold On A Minute. See you in our next episode.